But even though I have a lot to cover, I hope you'll indulge me. I'm going to start with a little bit of a personal story. Um, as you can probably tell, um, I didn't grow up in Canada. I grew up in a small town of about 25 million people uh, in India called Bombay. It's a very interesting place to grow up. Um, but I grew up with a fair degree of privilege, to be honest. Um, and privilege is a funny thing, as many of you will know. You don't really recognize privilege until you lose it, at least in part. And that's what happened. So as I was growing up, uh, my family suffered a series of financial setbacks. We lost our home. Then my father died. And the future that was originally really quite certain and secure became desperately uncertain. Uh, and I was a, it was the early part of my teens at this point. My grandparents took me in, uh, my maternal grandparents. And they, they gave me a home. Um, and it was them who, years later, when I wanted to study abroad, when I wanted to, uh, to seek a, a higher education and come to Canada, they were the ones who literally paid my way. They were the ones who paid for my tuition when I was an international student for that first year and a half. And I'm sure you realize international student tuition is no joke at all, no matter where you are in this country. And it, because of the international student status, of course, I had visa restrictions, so I couldn't even work off campus. There were very few jobs I could apply for. And it took me about a year and a half before I could land one of the few jobs on campus that I was eligible for. Oddly, by that point, I'd become a permanent resident. But I finally managed to be able to pay my own tuition, start to, to be able to support myself. And that was when my grandparents came to visit me. Now, I want you to appreciate at this point, just especially during that first year and a half, just how motivated I was to do well. Because I knew that every semester that I made the dean's list, those letters of commendation would make their way back to my grandfather in India. Right? So they came and they spent about three weeks with me. It was the summer in Vancouver, which is a glorious time anyway. But it was a very, very memorable experience for me. After spending three weeks with me, they went on to the United States, where my uh, grandfather's brother still lives in Massachusetts. And they were meant to spend more time there, but then my grandmother cut short the trip. She wanted to go back home. So they did. They flew back to India. Um, and about seven days after landing in Bombay, my grandmother passed away. Ten days after that, my grandfather passed away. And by itself, I think this is not an unusual story, when you, especially this is a couple that, been, that have been married for more than 50 years. So that's not unusual for that to happen particularly. But I think what is remarkable for me and what makes this a bittersweet memory is that I think very few of us get a chance to experience that degree of closure with someone who is that important to them. So, but I'm also acutely aware that if it were not for my grandparents' support, I would not have traveled to Canada. I would not have become a Canadian citizen. I would not have become a university professor, and I certainly wouldn't be at Brock today. At the same time, I feel that, you know, I, when I think about higher education, I certainly believe that it is a vehicle for economic and social mobility. I want to see if this works here. There we go. And that's why the term social justice is in the title of my talk. And I think to some degree that's unusual. People don't usually like to explicitly incorporate references to, to politics in, in their talks, certainly at universities, unless they're at the University of Toronto, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but earlier this summer, at my institution, we hosted an event called Digital Pedagogy Lab. And Jesse Stommel, who's an extraordinary scholar, he's the editor of Hybrid Pedagogy, he said this in his closing keynote, and it really struck me. He says, increasingly, I think the work of education is activism and not teaching. And when he said this, one of the first things this reminded me of is the writings of the incomparable Bell Hooks, and I have to do this really close, who quite a while ago wrote this, that her commitment to engage pedagogy is an expression of political activism. And so with this in mind, I want to foreground my activism. I want to make very explicit my ideology. I certainly believe that higher education is a vehicle for economic and social mobility. I think it is a tool with which we can unlock human potential. But at the same time, if you're like me, the more you examine the structure of higher education, the more you see that it actually replicates and reinforces existing power structures. My story is becoming less and less common every single day in this country. Few people realize that there's actually language embedded within the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights concerning the importance of equal access to education and higher education at that. But I really think when, when even my colleagues learn about this, our minds immediately go to the third world, maybe where there's 
insufficient infrastructure or not enough seats for the number of students, places like where I grew up. But this applies over here in Canada in, 26, in 2017 now, or 2018 at this point. Here's a screenshot. You might be familiar with this. I was digging around, and I must say, Brock could do a better job of being transparent about its cost of attendance. <laughs> it's very confusing. <laughs> but this is an estimate. This is a, a, an estimated budget for a student at Brock, right? And you put that together, this is not an expensive way to live. You're sharing a dorm on campus, for example. This is not some swanky you know, private apartment being rented. But it still estimates that it's somewhere between $21,500 and $24,500 per year of attendance at Brock. So let's assume for the moment that plan A is you were born into a wealthy family. That's your plan. That's fantastic if that works for you. right? <laughs> but most people don't have plan A. So plan B is that we work. So here's a uh, back of napkin sort of calculation for you. Working a minimum wage job, how many hours would it take a student at Brock to pay for a single year of attendance? Right? Those are your numbers. Now this depends, could be arts, could be business, but it's somewhere between 36 and 40 hours a week, 52 weeks of the year to pay for a single year of attendance. There are not enough hours in the week, in the day, to be able to work to pay your way through school at Brock. And I don't mean to single out Brock, this is everywhere in this country, but this is the reality. So if you have a sense that yes, when I was an undergraduate, I used to work as well, no, not like this. It has never been like this. Students across this country and students here in Ontario are working at rates that nobody has before. This was just a few years ago, but you can see a massive spike across the country in the increase in hours that students are working. So if you think, you know, plan B is working, paying your way through school, that's not a viable plan, not if you want to attend a single class or do any homework. So plan C. And I hope at this point this is not a spoiler, because this movie was out a while ago. <laughs> but if you remember the movie, this is a living nightmare, and it is that we are surrounded by people who are crushed by debt, and we are just as blissfully unaware of it. Student debt in this country, in this province, averages close to $30,000. That's on average, okay? In 2010, the federal government had to raise the official debt ceiling for student debt, and that debt ceiling is gonna be breached again two years from now. They're gonna to have to raise it again, right? According to StatsCan, five years after having graduated, barely one-third of our students have freed themselves from the shackles of this debt. And it's not just the financial implications of the debt that I want you to consider. We all have student wellness programs. As a psychologist, what is the impact on mental health of this level of debt? What's the impact on the delaying of life milestones, for example? Here's a survey, data from a survey of 18,000 students from 26 universities in this country trying to get at what is the impact on, on life, on education, on life choices of student debt. It's incredible. I should say that I'm gonna tweet out and openly license all of my slides, so feel free to grab them later and repurpose them in any way you like. But this is an image that always makes me chuckle. My alma mater is the University of British Columbia. Wonderful school. And a few years ago, they had a marketing campaign. They wanted to celebrate their, their graduates around convocation. They put these posters on the ground around campus. They gave students these markers. Fill in your most memorable experience, they said. That's not what they were hoping was going to happen. But that's the image that went viral. And there's a reason for this, right? There's a lot lurking behind this kind of uh, a, a statement. And one of the things that's lurking behind it is food insecurity. At the University of British Columbia, there's been a 100% increase in the use of the food bank by students for both of the last two years consecutively. That's UBC. But you see the same thing in Alberta. You see the same thing here. This is right across the country. If you're interested in this, I would urge you that you look at this report, which was published about a year ago, that really chronicles the case, the problem of food insecurity on campuses. Right. And in the midst of all of this, I'm talking about unaffordability more broadly, and of course, food insecurity is one very serious implication of that. But in the midst of all of this, I'm gonna pick on a small piece to talk about for maybe about 15 minutes and that's required course materials. And it may seem like a silly, small piece of the pie to pick on, but there's a few reasons why I talk about things like textbooks so much. 
One is, as an individual faculty member, certainly as individual educators, we don't control tuition individually. We don't control the cost of living. And Lord knows, in a place like Vancouver, that's a serious issue, is the cost of living. But we do control the cost of required course materials. In fact, faculty are the only people. We have individual choice over here. We have freedom. So control is a really big issue. That's one of the reasons why we talk about this. But the other is that there's actually no other consumer good, period, that has risen in cost as much as commercial textbooks have. Nothing, not even healthcare. If you go back to 1977, which is when the statistics began being calculated, they've risen by more than 1,000%. And I've spent enough time in these databases to tell you, it doesn't matter what five or 10-year period you want to look at, it's always been between three and four times the rate of inflation. As educators, raise your hand if you're used to receiving unsolicited copies of new editions with only cosmetic changes in your mailbox. Yeah, these are open secrets. We know this, right? As an educator teaching introductory psychology every year, I do not need a new edition, a new way of describing classical conditioning every three years. I really don't. Right. So we now live in the era of the $400 textbook. At my institution, tuition for a three credit course is $400. Imagine students walking in, surprise, walk into the bookstore, your textbook costs the same as tuition. This is not an isolated example, here's another one. Although I'm picking on one publisher this morning. I'm not pleased with them right now, as you'll see. $400 for a textbook. There's only one appropriate reaction to a $400 textbook, and I think this is it. <laughs> I love that reaction. So this is why student unions, student associations across the country have launched, uh, launched a social media campaign with the hashtag textbookbroke, often with the, pro with the province right behind it. So this is textbookbrokepc. At the start of every semester, students are tweeting out images of their receipts. How much are they spending on textbooks for a single semester? They're wanting to show the world. They're wanting to raise awareness. We have a principal agent problem over here. The faculty who assign resources are not the ones who have to pay for that. So often, faculty have no idea of the cost of resources that they've just assigned. This is Textbook Broke BC. You'll see it as well. Textbook Broke Alberta, AB. I spent $650 on textbooks. I could have spent that on rent. Textbook broke SK, Saskatchewan. I just spent $750 on textbooks. I'd rather spend my money on food. I would rather he spends his money on food. Students have been at the forefront of this. The Ontario USA, what do you call it? Ontario University Student Association? Alliance. Alliance, thank you. They've been doing amazing work helping raise awareness about this, and they were recently recognized by Minister Matthews as well. This is happening at the federal level as well. The Canadian Alliance of Student Associations as well, advocating in Ottawa at their pre-budget consultation. Their first pillar, their first ask, was funding to support the development of open educational resources. Students are lobbying the government to try and provide the resources to enable faculty to save them money. They shouldn't have to do this, but they are doing this. And you're gonna see this more and more. Sorry, I have to sort of hover back here. So imagine you're a student now. You register for a course, you receive the syllabus, and of course, we optimistically list certain resources as required. Students are bright, they're creative, they're flexible, and of course, they'll do all sorts of things. You're aware of these. These are not new strategies. They'll buy a used copy if they can, if there's not a new edition that's come out just before the semesters began, right? At the end, they'll resell it if they can to recover some of that money, again. But if there's a new edition that's come out midway through the semester, their $200 textbook is now worth 10 bucks. They'll buy online, they'll share interlibrary loans, all of this stuff. And of course, the older edition. If you're like me, the start of every semester is peppered with emails that say something like, hey prof, do I really need the book? Or maybe even more common, hey prof, may I use an older edition, right? And of course, if you're like me, we always issue the standard cautionary notes. Well, you know, this is the one we're using. This is the one you're gonna be assessed on the basis of. You're responsible for the mismatch in content. I can't stop you from doing what you need to do. And sometimes, how can you argue with them? <laughs> this is a student, a real student at the University of Minnesota. They were assigned an $85 French textbook. They went to Amazon and bought not just the previous edition, but two older editions for eight bucks. This is their rationale. And again, if you're a scholar of French, maybe you will disagree with this vociferously, but this is not hard to understand, right? 
They are taking an academic risk though. Maybe the pagination has changed. Maybe there's an online homework solution platform that's built in, that's mapped on to the textbook. And this is the calculus of the undergraduate degree now. Is 10% of my grade coming from the online adaptive solution platform? If so, I'll take the hit on my grade. If it's 35% of my grade that's coming from the homework platform, then I can't take the hit on my grade. I'm gonna withdraw from that class. I'm gonna take another class. And that's precisely what's happening. We're seeing this certainly across the continent. Here's another illustration of the impact of this. Students in increasing numbers, about over 30% is our best estimate, in terms of self-reports anyway, are illegally downloading their books as well. This is a lovely screenshot uh, that includes a message from the student who took the time to actually scan and illegally upload a Pearson textbook. Look at that message. We'd be willing to pay a fair price for this book, but that'd be far south of the $200 you charge at the bookstore. Fix this, lower the tuition a bit, and maybe students like me won't spend several days scanning your materials and putting it online. <laughs> also clean the bathrooms. <laughs> Priorities. Students are risking prosecution. The system is, is making them make this choice in order to get access to materials. There's an especially dark corner of the internet that you may know, you may know of. It's called ratemyprofessor.com. <laughs> Students have already been using tags on that website for quite a while. This instructor actually requires a textbook. This instructor actually utilizes the assigned textbook. It's nothing worse than spending $200 on a textbook and being in this situation. Yes? We can make it worse and we can make it better. This is one of the ways in which we make it worse. So these are data from BC, data from 23 of the universities in BC, okay, several hundred students. A majority of our students in BC are not buying at least some of their required course textbooks because of cost. That's how that sentence ends, right? About a third of them earning a poor grade. I mentioned why. Many significant numbers taking fewer courses, not registering. Imagine choosing your timetable based on textbook costs. Very, very strange thing to do, especially if you're interested in curiosity-based learning. And this is not just serious for students. If you're an administrator, these numbers should worry you. This is a tangible impact on the institution, especially when we're all concerned, allegedly, about completion rates. But of course, now there's a new frontier in unaffordability, and that is the access code. And I want to talk about this briefly, because if you're like me, whenever those smiling faces knock on your office door, uninvited, without appointment, saying, hey, do you have a few minutes? Can I come in and talk to you about my latest bells and whistles? I'm a representative of, insert publisher name here. You'll invite them in, and you say, I'm glad you're here, because I want to talk about the affordability of your books. And they'll say, well, of course, I understand. This is a serious issue. We're very concerned about this. This is why we have soft cover versions. This is why we have loose leaf binder versions. This is why we have e-textbooks. This is why we're pushing an inclusive access model. Now, let's stop and talk about this briefly. The new model for commercial publishers is digital delivery. They call it inclusive access. That's a very shameful attempt to define something by naming it. It's like calling something the Patriot Act. It doesn't make it patriotic. Inclusive access is as exclusive as you can imagine. Students don't gain permanent access. They don't even buy the books. They lease access to the books. After six months, that access disappears. So if you take a course in anatomy and physiology, you want to go on to medical school, maybe you want to keep that book as a reference, too bad. If you have, let's say, a visual disability, you want access to assistive learning technologies. No, digital rights management, you can't copy paste, you can't print, sorry. It's terrible. Students will often spend more money using these methods because you can't even resell these, these materials. You are leasing access, you do not own it. It's terrifying. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Certainly, if you're interested in access and accessibility, be very wary of this model. Trust me, I understand the attraction for publishers. All of a sudden, they have guaranteed revenue from every, every single student. So what if faculty have to choose books from only a certain catalog and platform? So what if students can't opt out unless they obtain papal dispensation? So what? But this is why open educational resources are so important. This is a very different model. And maybe I'm gonna pause here and even just say this. Yesterday I was at a really interesting event. And this happens periodically, but I happened to share the stage with the CEO of Nelson Publishing. This has happened before with the CEO of Pearson Publishing. 
Nelson is, of course, Canada's oldest publishers, and they're very interesting. One of the things that, that sort of left a lot of jaws on the floor was when he stood up and openly acknowledged that they've been gouging students on price for over 100 years. That was interesting. It's part of their new pivot to digital delivery. We can talk about that later, but I expect that you're going to receive more and more communications from the commercial publishers pushing you, pushing your students to adopt all-in mandatory digital delivery platforms. Right? Be careful about this. So let's talk about open educational resources. Now, open educational resources are certainly not just resources that are free or that are online. Something that's online doesn't make it open. Content on CNN.com is fully all rights reserved copyrighted, right? That's not open. Content that's digital as well doesn't make it open. What makes it open is the permissions that are attached to it. And these are often referred to as the five R's. So the most important is reuse. So imagine free, unfettered reuse for students, for faculty. You don't have to obtain permission. You have this forever. For faculty, of course, these are pretty cool. We can revise and remix. We can localize, embed you know, local examples and statistics. We can weave our assignments through it. You don't have to tell students, don't read chapter three, take it out. If there's something missing, write it in. If you're dealing with a replicability crisis, let's say in, a, in your discipline, and you want to sort of modify what you think the canon actually means. You can make those changes midstream. You don't have to bend your course to map onto the table of contents of a textbook. You can modify your instructional materials to suit your pedagogical goals. This is more academic freedom. And for students, of course, I mentioned the importance of permanent retention. That's big. They retain and redistribute free. You do not have to require or ask permission. This is embedded within the license. Typically, Open educational resources are licensed with a Creative Commons license, which is a very, very popular form of licensing. The author still retains the copyright, of course. The only thing they're doing in advance is choosing how they're comfortable with other people using their work in the future. And you've probably seen these symbols around the web. They look a bit like hieroglyphics, I know, but if you can, if you can sort of decode what those four symbols mean, you can understand what any OER means in terms of the permissions you have. On the left, by simply means attribution you must give credit to the creators of this resource. Very straightforward, we're very accustomed to doing that in academia anyway. NC, you'll sometimes see that. You can use this in any way, but you're not gonna sell it on Amazon for $5,000. You're not gonna make a profit off this. Not commercial, non-commercial use only, right? And that's interesting because even your bookstore, if it wants to sell print copies of an open textbook, for example, they can cover their overhead, they can cover their personnel, they can cover uh, even, uh, obviously the cost of printing, even with an NC clause. It's easy to do. Share alike is the third one. This means you can take my book, let's say a, a book that I worked on, this one. If you want, take, take the time, translate this into French. Right? You can, because it's openly licensed. That would be a derivative work. But if you do that, and if I had a share alike clause on this book, I'm saying once you translate it, you're gonna share that translated version back with the comments. It's not just gonna be you that benefits from this work. Everyone's gonna benefit. Catch and release, essentially, yes. And very rarely, you see the last one, which stands for no derivatives, which is you can use this, but you're not permitted to revise or remix. You're not permitted to change it in any way. There's more than a billion such things, objects that are out there. And we use them all the time, even if you don't know that they're OER. Images, for example, are open, open educational resources. And I'm pointing to this one as a, for a couple of reasons. This is, of course, a very famous image. It's a very famous <laughs> painting. Vincent van Gogh's self-portrait. The Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands, which owned the copyright to this, has released it into the public. This is now public domain. This is now an open educational resource. This means you can download a one gigabyte size file scan of this painting for free. This is important because if you've ever taken a course on art history, you'll know those books are very expensive precisely because of the permissions involved. And the Rijksmuseum is not the only one that are doing this. The New York Metropolitan Museum of Art is another. There's dozens of museums that are following suit. Images are OER, right? Videos are OER. Perhaps you or you've seen people use TED Talks in the context of their teaching, right? You know, TED Talks, it's bite-sized sort of glib solutions to complex problems. <laughs> but there's a reason why you don't have to install some sketchy plugin in your Chrome browser because you're afraid that the link on YouTube will go dead. You can legally download TED Talks because they're openly licensed, right? Simulations, 
If you teach any of the STEM disciplines, you should be aware of the University of Colorado at Boulder's website and the FET simulations, interactive simulations for dozens of areas. These are all openly licensed. Simulations like this are open educational resources. If you teach English literature, tens of thousands of classics have been digitized thanks to Project Gutenberg. So if you teach the collected works of Shakespeare, for example, ask yourself, why are you asking your students to spend $100 when every one of those plays is in the public domain? For what? So that there's a new scholar every, every three years who has a new commentary because it's that radical? Is it really worth the preface? The preface is worth $100? Think about this. And of course, textbooks. In BC, we've been leading this charge. Five years ago, the BC Open Textbook Project was launched. The goal was to harvest, create, or adapt open textbooks for the 40 highest enrolled undergraduate courses in the province, which of course are the 40 highest enrolled courses anywhere in the country. We now have 225 books in the repository, right? You can go here, but why go to BC when you can go to Ontario? You have the same thing now. Over 200 books available for the highest enrolled courses and much more. These are transparently peer-reviewed. You can actually see the names and institutional affiliations of the faculty who have reviewed the books. You can download them in a variety of digital formats. And of course, your campus can set up a print-on-demand service as well. Here's one example. As you can see, this is one of the books I worked on. This book existed. I didn't write this book. I adapted this book. It was a US edition of a research methods book, but of course, laws governing research with human participants are different over here. My discipline's dealing with a replicability issue, as I mentioned, so we wanted to talk about that, also talk about open science practices, a number of other things. So a colleague of mine adapted this, released this as a Canadian edition. We were able to do this, and of course, now this is used across the country. You'll see that this is, uh, you, can, you can download this in a wide variety of digital formats, so it doesn't matter if you're using an e-reader or an iPad or a desktop, it really doesn't matter but print as well. And print is really important. This is another reason why I really dislike the mandatory forced purchasing platform programs of commercial publishers. Even though many administrators still cling on to this rubbish nonsense about students as digital natives, they're not. There's a vast gulf between knowing how to use Snapchat and knowing that a PDF document has a search function. You have to think about that. They're not digital natives in every way that you would want them to be. Students still prefer print, overwhelmingly, when it comes to textbooks, if they can afford it. And the beauty is with open textbooks, they can. So this 400-page textbook, for example, my students can obtain a professionally bound print copy for $12. And when that's the case, they buy it, right? Even the bookstore is happy this way. It's amazing how much money bookstores lose on the unsold copies that they have to return to publishers at the end of the semester. But the nice thing about OER is it's not just something that serves social justice or that enables pedagogical innovation, it's also supported by research. There's been about 15 peer-reviewed studies that have been published looking at the impact on educational outcomes of the adoption of OER. This is one of the larger ones. As you can see, almost 17,000 students across 10 institutions. And it says the same thing that every other study has said. Students who are assigned OER instead of commercial textbooks, even if you match the groups in advance on a variety of covariates, so there's no pre-existing differences, they outperform them. They perform better in terms of the number of students who pass the course with a C or better. You have better course persistence with lower drop rates and withdrawal rates, and you even have higher enrollment. They are actually channeling those cost savings into taking an additional course. There's a net benefit to the institution of OER adoption. There's not one study that said something different. Here's another illustration of the same thing, and I like this because this includes a rubric. This was developed by David Wiley, who's a pioneer in the open education movement. It's a fun little rubric. On the y-axis, you can see the cost to students of required course materials, which uh, you can see anywhere from zero to 400. X-axis, the percentage of students completing with a C or better, so think about it as a, I can use this as a prerequisite now if I, get it, if I pass as a, at a C level. So mad, glad, sad, red, but two of them are grayed out because they're boring. <laughs> so bottom left, let's say you choose not to buy the book that's been assigned in your course and you do poorly. Well, you're sad, but nobody's surprised, right? Or you buy the book, you spend the 400 bucks and you do well. Well, you're glad, but again, nobody's surprised. This is what we hope would happen. But consider the case of students at Mercy College in New York. They were taking a course in math. The math book 
was accompanied or wrapped in with a platform which some of you will be familiar with called MyMathLab. Cost students about 200 bucks. 48% of the students were passing the course with a C or better. They switched to an open textbook for math and an open platform for homework as well called My Open Math. Look it up. All of a sudden, 62% of the students are passing the course with a C or better. And that's the difference between mad and rad. Right? As an individual faculty member, this is what I saw the first semester I started adopting open textbooks. This was a number of years ago. These are comments from my anonymous course evaluations. And you can see it. many students love the cost savings, of course, the flexibility of the formats and all of that. But I love that comment in the middle. Right? I fell into my discipline because I had an amazing experience and a terrific instructor in my first year psychology class. That's precisely what I want, that opportunity not to be stolen from our students. So this is me today, or maybe in a few years. <laughs> and like many of you, I teach many courses, upper level courses that don't have a textbook anyway. So I'm accustomed to putting together readings, chapters, and so on. But when I do, I certainly push that it be open. Now, of course, there's a number of people doing this over here already. And I'm glad that at the end, towards the, after the student panel, after David, in fact, there's a few people who are going to share their experience at Brock. But you should know, you have colleagues doing this right now. You have colleagues who are championing this right now in your midst. These are just some of them. And I'd love if we could just take a minute to recognize their efforts with a bit of applause. So please. So at least. At least two of them are here with us, in fact, right now. Uh, so Nicola's here and Santo's here as well, and hopefully they'll get to speak to you uh, a little bit later. And if you want to chat with them later, hopefully they'll be uh, willing to share their experiences as well. But this is not just something that happens elsewhere. This is already happening at Brock, and you can certainly get involved and support it much more. But now let's talk about where we can go further than this. What if we move beyond individual grassroots adoptions of fabulous champions like Nicola and Santo? What if the institution manages to put together an entire curriculum, let's say a whole degree program, where students don't have to spend a single cent on textbooks? That's what the Americans call a Z degree. This was pioneered at Tidewater Community College. Of course, they're going to decrease the cost to graduate quite a lot. And there's been a fair bit of research at Tidewater. One of the things they found, once again, was that whether the courses in this program, which was an associate's degree, a two-year program, whether the courses were taught face-to-face -face or online, you're seeing an, a gain throughout the course throughput rate. So an increase in the number of students who are, perform, uh, who are passing the course with a C or better, and a decrease in the drop rate and withdrawal rate. So student persistence, student performance, significant gains on both sides. Right? And it's because of the success of this model that a group called Achieving the Dream supported the development of Z degrees at 38 other institutions in the United States. That's happening right now. BC Campus, of course, has followed suit. That's the BC institution. That's the corollary to eCampus Ontario. Sponsoring the development of Z creds, as we properly pronounce it, yes. at three institutions. One of them, thankfully, is mine. And in fact, a month ago, we launched so we launched Canada's first Z cred on the 1st of November. We've started with just a one-year program. We're quickly building up to a two-year associate's degree. This is not hard to do. So you can put together courses in which you have adoptions of open textbooks, which are easily available for the first and second year survey uh, course level. Add to that courses in which students are maybe utilizing resources that the institutions already spent money subscribing to in terms of library database subscriptions. Add courses for which there are, you know, there's no required resource anyway. You put that together, you have a viable pathway. But the game changer over here is being able to give students the chance in advance during registration to know which pathways have zero textbook costs. Not let it be a surprise. After you register, you walk into the bookstore, surprise. They can choose. And we are seeing a tremendous difference. I can tell you I've been tracking the registration numbers for the spring at Kwantlen. You're talking about an average weightless size of between 50 and 100 for the Z sections, and an average waitlist of about five on the non-Z sections. It's astonishing, right? But this is only part of the excitement. We're still talking about resources. And the open education movement, even though it's a lot to do with equitable access to resources, to knowledge, it's also about equitable access to knowledge creation. And this is the business of open pedagogy. But before I talk about it, I actually want to show you an illustration. 
I love this image. Take a look at this. This is an illustration from a 19th century French book that described various scenarios having to do with the future. This was the classroom of the future. It was actually the classroom of the year 2000, so I guess the recent past. Ideology is always embedded within our learning environments, and I think this reveals a lot, right? Who is the professor? Who is permitted to be the professor in this illustration? Who is permitted to be in the classroom as a student? What about the, the method of learning? Somehow information is being fed into this electronic relay system. It's magically, I guess, appearing in the minds of the students. There's no active learning. There's no peer assessment, collaboration. There's no need to take notes. Where am I teaching a learning center, people? You must be shuddering right now. Oh, and of course, you can't miss the graduate student teaching assistant doing the actual labor. <laughs> it's amazing. But even though this is funny to look at, I think it's really strange because when I think about how we really practice education, not what we say we ought to be doing, I actually don't think it's very far from this. If you're familiar with the Brazilian philosopher, writer, Paulo Freire, you'll know that this is very similar to what he described as the banking model of education. It, as in this banking model, turns them, students, into containers to be filled by the teacher. The more completely she fills the receptacles, the better a teacher she is. The more meekly the receptacles permit themselves to be filled, the better students they are. Education thus becomes the act of depositing, in which students are the depositories and the teacher is the depositor. In the banking concept of education, knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. There is so much to unpack, even in that last paragraph. But this is precisely it. Think about something even as benign and seemingly attractive as learning outcomes. And I know learning outcomes are useful. We can talk about backwards course design. We can talk about where this comes from, accreditation, all of this. I get it. But I do think it's odd. Part of me does feel it's odd that I can tell a student, this is what the journey is going to look like. Right? This is what we're going to cover. This is how your, the skills you're going to develop. This is how your life is going to be different after you take the course. And I can tell you what the journey will look like before I even meet you, because clearly you're not going to influence the nature of this journey. I do think that's odd. Right? We see this even with course policies. Consider the absolutely ablest and stupid course policy that some instructors institute concerning the banning of laptops that require students with a disability who require a laptop in the classroom to out themselves, for example, this is ridiculous. This is banking, right? What about the LMS, the learning management system? What do you use over here? Blackboard, Moodle, D2L, Canvas? Sky. Sky, of course, you have to be different. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good that it's open source, but I'm interested in the mentality, right? I mean, it's one thing to give people new technology, but to have them use it in a different way. One of the things that really strikes me is this happens everywhere. We use Moodle at my institution as well. So let's say you upload resources, activities, the whole structure of the course. And at the end, you know, maybe you'll archive it because you want to reuse some of that structure. You'll maybe uh, restore it to a new shell in the future, perhaps. But what's the one thing we scrub from the LMS at the end of the semester? Is any trace of student activity. So not only have I told you at the start that you're not going to affect the nature of this journey, now I've confirmed that everything you did was basically pointless. These are the glimpses. These are the things that, that make me feel like we're doing something really strange. And of course, the LMS, if you're interested, certainly read Audrey Waters. The LMS, she writes, is ultimately a piece of administrative software. There's that word management in there that sort of gives it away that this software that purports to address questions about teaching and learning, but that really works to manage and administer, in turn, often circumscribing pedagogical possibilities, as though learning is something that's best achieved through management. And then, of course, assignments. I'm just sniping at everything now. <laughs> so I'm going to say this. Traditional assignments really, really are terrible. Think about the traditional assignment as disposable, really. You assign a student a research essay, let's say. It may be their 16th research essay in the course of their undergraduate degree. They will work for hours on this, on, this, on this piece of writing. They will submit it. Only one person will ever read their work. 
That seems like a bit of a waste. And then we will take workshops with the Center for Teaching and Learning. We'll learn how to provide careful, formative feedback. And how can I phrase this in a way that the students won't react poorly to? All this care and attention, 10% of your students will bother to pick up the essay. 10% of those students will actually read the feedback. Put together all of that, the hours that students are spending for just one person and the hours that we are spending for almost no one. Traditional assignments are sucking energy out of the world. So what we instead, we repurpose, harness our students' energy, potential, even their creativity, and have them produce resources for the commons. We can achieve the same outcomes and many more, right? There's a lot we can do. One of my favorite examples to start with is maybe a bad word in academia. Yes? This is like the 11th commandment in academia, thou shalt not cite Wikipedia. It's interesting, and I think, again, we're being short-sighted and foolish. We know this is the first port of call for the public when they're looking for information. We know this is the first port of call for our students. And if we're really honest, in many cases, for us. Yet, we continue to bury our heads in the sand, pretending that we are not the best placed in the world to actually address this. There are 9,000, just to give you an example in my discipline, there are about 9,000 psychology articles on Wikipedia. About two-thirds of them have gone through Wikipedia's version of peer review, which is not what you and I would consider peer review. And about 10% of those articles are considered good articles by Wikipedia standards, which are probably not what we would consider to be good articles. Right? So if you think there's a problem with reliability in Wikipedia, you're not wrong. But what I'm saying is we are the best place to address this. So imagine, for example, Amin Azam, who's a faculty member at the University of California in the medical school. He's been working with his students for many years now to write, edit, improve, update articles related to a variety of medical topics on Wikipedia. These are people who are going to have to walk into a room and in a couple of minutes explain complex medical syndromes in lay terminology to a lay audience. What better way to practice than by Reddit writing articles in Wikipedia? It's fantastic. They've been building it, improving it. This is happening in dozens of disciplines, and you can do this as well. The Wiki Education Foundation has a tremendous suite of resources, step-by-step -step guides for faculty, for students, Campus Wikipedia Ambassador Program, for heaven's sake. Look at Plymouth State University, if you want to do something different, where my friend Robin DeRosa works in New Hampshire. Again, she teaches early American literature, open uh, public domain readings, but the students were involved in curating and selecting the readings for the course. It's a lovely way to introduce them and bring them in, give them some agency. Ohio State University, successive cohorts of students studying environmental science have been writing bite-sized chunks. These are now an open textbook. It's edited, overseen by the faculty. This is a book that can be used by any of you, but it's student work that's serving the public interest. Students at Simon Fraser University in Burnaby Instead of giving yet another oral presentation, they were challenged to produce a two to three minute instructional video, an overview of Cialdini's principles of persuasion. They submitted it to an international student video competition. They won. Look at that, 6, 000, that's US. That's like 35,000 Canadian. <laughs> but more importantly, their video is now being used by instructors in Malaysia, in Turkey, in Hawaii, to teach the science of persuasion. And that's the power that I'm talking about of open pedagogy. Right. Students at Kent State, again, instead of a research essay, take your budding social scientific knowledge, write an engaging, evidence-based, and brief op-ed piece, submit it. You might end up with a publication at the end of the semester, but you're sharing your knowledge with the community and you're ending up with a skill that is incredible. I would love my students to be able to finish their courses with the skill to do this. It's powerful. So thinking about scaffolding this public scholarship, I'm gonna skip over that example a little bit quickly and I'll finish with this example as a last example. This was my first foray into open pedagogy. Years ago, I teach an upper level course on the psychology of genocide. And one of my earliest partnerships was with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. They have a big database, but they also have a book. In Poland, there was a ghetto called the Lutz Ghetto. It was, of course, governed by a Judenrat, like most other ghettos, a Jewish council that were in a very, very difficult place. 
They tried to do the best they could for all of the children in the ghetto in the way of providing them with educational opportunity, but you can imagine the constraints, the challenges. And so they had an annual day, and the, student, and the children in this ghetto, the students of the, of the school, I guess you could call it, were so happy and so grateful, they put together this little scrapbook, and they each signed it, thanking the Judenrat for doing what they could for the students. As you can imagine, the book survived, right? And so the Holocaust Memorial Museum in the US has the book, they have all of the names, the signatures, but they didn't know what happened to each of the students. And so all they needed was energy, people to take their names in, put them into these large databases, internet, uh, Red Cross tracing service, and reconstruct biographies. These are real people. And so my students started doing this work, reconstructing their biographies. And that's important to do when you're examining something like genocide. You don't want to get lost in big millions. You need to understand this is a real thing with real people. And of course, their work was vetted, uh, vetted by museum staff, and then it entered a permanent online archive. So imagine the impact for the families, for the descendants of those children. But I'll never forget the day that there was one student who walked in, and she was crying one morning. And she was crying, and, and we, we, obviously we couldn't start the class. We had to address what was going on. And she was crying, she explained, because she'd finally, the previous evening, finally looked up a name. And for the first time, that child had survived. None of the other ones she'd looked up had survived. I will never forget that as an educational experience. I will never forget the legacy her work leaves for that family, for the museum, and for the world. I mentioned David Wiley earlier. He also described traditional assignments as a bit like having a vehicle. And we can certainly transport our students from where they are now to where they might go at the end of the semester in terms of skill development. But traditional assignments are a lot, he writes, like driving an aircraft down the highway. I mean, you could do that, but people are going to look at you strangely. Because it's built for, it's capable of so, so, so much more. And that's the whole point with open pedagogy. There's lots of resources available if you're interested in this. Certainly, Hugh McGuire is here. He represents the Rebus Foundation, among other things. And there's this lovely guide to even what's essentially open pedagogy, to making open textbooks with students. I mentioned the Wiki Education Foundation. These are just some of the resources. Many faculty are interested in cost savings, but many come for the cost savings, but they stay for the pedagogy. This whole notion of open pedagogy, it's fundamentally, as Robin DeRosa and I write, it's fundamentally about a dream of a public learning commons, where students, where learners are empowered to shape the world as they encounter it. There are some things to be wary of, for sure, and I know I need to finish, so I'm gonna whip through them. I will say this very briefly. As we talk about access, let's not forget about accessibility. It's not just about not systematically excluding a segment of our population. It's about all benefiting from taking a more inclusive approach. As we push and explore digital technologies, let's be wary of digital redlining, policies and practices that reinforce inequities in our system. Not everyone has broadband access. Not everyone has expensive devices. Not everyone has the time when they're holding down a part-time job and they're a parent. Think about digital redlining over here. And as you see more of the commercial entities wandering into this space, touting language that sounds a lot like openness, remember open washing. You will see this when it's marketing that sounds open, but it's really a perpetuation of proprietary practices. Be very careful of this. Openness ultimately is about access, but it's in equal parts about agency. I said it's agency for faculty, if you think about academic freedom and the push permissions to revise and remix and contextualize. Agency for students in terms of being involved, shaping the course policies, the content, producing resources that will serve the commons. A lot of agency, right? And I'll finish with this image, which is a photograph I took when I was visiting South Africa a year and a half ago. What you're seeing over there is, is downtown Cape Town with Table Mountain, very famous Table Mountain behind it. What's less obvious over here is that I took this photograph when I was st standing at the edge of Robben Island. Robben Island was formerly a leper colony before it was converted into a, a maximum security prison for political prisoners. 
Arguably its most famous inmate was former president of South Africa, Nobel laureate Nelson Mandela. He spent 18 years of his 27 year prison sentence on the island. If you ever have an opportunity to visit Robben Island, I recommend it. One of the main reasons why is that all of the tour guides at the prison now, at least right now, are all former inmates. So when I was there, and you can imagine, we got a chance to ask them about how they managed to maintain hope, small acts of daily resistance, especially when the inequity, when the injustice is so evident, it's right before your eyes. And this experience stands out for me as an educational experience because I really do believe that education at its finest is democratizing, it's liberatory, it's anti-racist, it's decolonized, and it is open. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Roger. You. No, we've left. Went a little bit over, but hopefully we have. Yeah, time. we have a few. We have a few minutes for some questions. Um, yes. Anybody? Uh, anybody have a burning question? Even comments. Anything. Even comments, I love it. Yes. Thanks. Anything at all? I'll run up with the mic. Thanks, Julia. Not all at once, please. <laughs> I see a hand up in the back. Um, and as the mic's going up, uh, uh, thank you for using the mic. Again, in terms of inclusive design, let's remember, even if you don't need the mic, there may be somebody in the room that's hard of hearing. Thank you very much for the presentation today. My name is Robert McRae. I teach in the um, uh, Adelaide program here at Brock. Um, we've been talking about um, having our program uh, embrace OER as a, as a program. I didn't know the terminology, so thank you for um, introducing to me the ZCred, uh, Z programs. Um, <clears throat> one of the concerns we have is that we want to, um, you know, have a statement have for our students yeah. um, that, that embraces OER across the program. The problem we have is that currently we don't have a lot of resources. So how do we transition and make the statement, but not fall victim to open washing? Well, I think, thank you for asking that. I'm really delighted that you're interested in moving into this space. So I will say, first of all, you've got local allies and then you've got others. <clears throat> Your local allies are here. So eCampus Ontario is certainly in the province. They have uh, certainly uh, expertise and the ability to link you with a lot of people, even if it may perhaps even resources. Brock itself, I believe, is going to kickstart a bit of a, a campus group that's going to focus on supporting open ed. But especially within your discipline, I would say, please reach out. There are many people in your specific area who are interested in justice, not the least of which is because your program aligns very well with, with the valuing social justice. So I would say working within your discipline, uh, working with the community that's already practicing openness, you don't have to do this by yourself. So reach out. Uh, there's a lot of material that you simply can reuse. You don't have to recreate stuff, revise, re uh, uh, remix, adapt before creating. But more than anything, uh, let's just connect you with the community. Uh, there's many things you can do tangibly that will make a difference. Uh, start sort of easy, experiment, make your way down. Maybe start with adopting, and over time, then you can start to make revisions and adaptations um, and certainly build up that way. Uh, in some cases, there are professional societies within your discipline that will fund these sorts of projects uh, beyond uh, uh, agencies uh, like BC Campus, eCampus Ontario, and the rest. Uh, but I would say, uh, do not let the lack of expertise, the lack of resources, or the lack of collaborators be a barrier, uh, because there are easy ways to circumvent any of that. Any of that right? So um, please reach out.